Twenty years ago, it appeared for a moment that all of our energy problems could be solved. It was the announcement of cold fusion, nuclear energy like that which powers the sun, but at room temperature on a tabletop. It promised to be cheap, limitless, and clean. Cold fusion would end our dependence on the Middle East and stop those greenhouse gases blamed for global warming. It would change everything. But then, just as quickly as it was announced, it was discredited so thoroughly that cold fusion became a catchphrase for junk science. Well, a funny thing happened on the way to oblivion. For many scientists today, cold fusion is hot again. We can wield the power of nuclear physics on a tabletop. The potential is unlimited. That is the most powerful energy source known to man. Michael McCubrey says he has seen that energy more than 50 times in cold fusion experiments he's doing at SRI International, a respected California lab that does extensive work for the government. McCubrey is an electrochemist who imagines in 20 years the creation of a clean nuclear battery. For example, a laptop would come pre-charged with all of the energy that you would ever intend to use. You're, you're now decoupled from your charger and, and, and the wall socket. Automobiles? Same. Potential is for an energy source that would run your car for three, four years, for example. And you take it in for servicing every four years and they'd give you a new power supply. Power stations? You can imagine a one-for-one -one plug in replacement for nuclear fuel rods. And the difference only would be that at the end of the lifetime of that fuel rod, you didn't have radioactive waste that needed to be disposed of. McCubrey showed us just how simple the experiment looks. There are only three main ingredients. First, palladium, a metal in the platinum family. Second, a kind of hydrogen called deuterium, which is found in seawater. Deuterium is essentially unlimited. There is 10 times as much energy in a gallon of seawater from the deuterium contained within it than there is in a gallon of gasoline. The palladium is placed in water containing deuterium, and the third ingredient is an electric current. So the experiment's running inside this box. That's correct. Can we open it up? We can look inside. There's, there's, there's very little to see. The experiment is wrapped in insulation and instruments. They're looking for what they call excess heat. In other words, is more energy coming out than the electric current puts in. No one knows exactly how excess heat would be generated in the experiment, but McCubrey shows us what he thinks is happening. This is an artist's rendition of uh, deuterium atoms. At the atomic level, palladium looks like a lattice, and the electricity drives the deuterium to the palladium. They sit on the surface and they pop inside the lattice. McCubrey believes there is a nuclear reaction, possibly a fusion process like what happens in the sun, but occurring inside the metal at a slower rate and without dangerous radiation. What we're trying to do is Scientists today like to call it a nuclear effect rather than cold fusion. At least 20 labs working independently have published reports of excess heat, heat up to 25 times greater than the electricity going in. This little piece of palladium metal has about a third as much energy as the battery in your automobile. So very small volumes, very small masses can produce large amounts of energy. McCubrey has been working on this since that first discredited claim of cold fusion made headlines 20 years ago. We devised an experiment. Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons amazed the world in 1989 with their cold fusion news conference at the University of Utah. Fleischmann, in particular, was one of the world's leading electrochemists, and the announcement of room temperature fusion set the world on fire. We have found conditions where fusion takes place. Immediately, prestigious labs at MIT and Caltech rushed to reproduce the experiment but they didn't get the same results as Fleischmann and Pons. We have no evidence in our laboratory with any of our samples for fusion. The careers of Fleischmann and Pons were destroyed quick as a nuclear flash. We worked for five years on this. Names once linked to a Nobel Prize were forgotten by nearly everyone, and most of the scientific world today is happy to leave it that way. I'm still waiting for the water heaters. I'm still waiting 
for the thing that will produce heat on demand. Richard Garwin is one of the most respected physicists in the world and has been since the 1950s when he helped design the most successful fusion experiment of all time. The hydrogen bomb, sort of the ultimate in hot fusion. Yes, it was uh, unfortunately a very successful experiment. This experiment... Garwin was a critic of Martin Fleischmann back in 1989, and he has seen the reports on the research that has been done since. You think McCubre is mistaken? Yes. After all the work that he's done? Yes, I think so. Why? I think probably he measures the input power wrong. It's one of the most common criticisms of cold fusion experiments, that the amount of electricity going in and the heat coming out are simply mismeasured. It's possible, it is possible that I have been mismeasuring energy for, for 20 years, but I think it extremely unlikely. A very large number of people have been making these measurements and measurement of current voltage, temperature, resistance. They're some of the simplest measurements that a physicist or physical scientist will measure. But there's another problem that critics point out. The experiments produce excess heat at best 70% of the time. It can take days or weeks for the excess heat to show up, and it's never the same amount of energy twice. I require that you be able to make one of these things, replicate it, put it here, it heats up the cup of tea, I'll drink the tea, then you make me another cup of tea, and I'll drink that too. That's not it. For you to be a believer, it has to work 100% of the time. Uh, pretty much. Our critics often complain that we can't boil water to make tea. We could have, in fact, boiled 64 gallons of water and made 1,000 cups of tea had we chosen to do so. No one's sure why the experiments can't be consistently reproduced. McCubrey thinks it has something to do with how the palladium is prepared. thinks it has something to do with how the palladium is prepared. He's working with this Italian government lab called Enea, where some of the most reliable palladium is made. With so many open questions, we wanted to find out whether cold fusion is more than a tempest in a teapot. So we asked the American Physical Society, the top physics organization in America, to recommend an independent scientist. They gave us Rob Duncan vice chancellor of research at the University of Missouri and an expert in measuring energy. When we first called you uh -huh. and said we'd like you to look into cold fusion for 60 minutes, what did you think when you hung up the phone? I think my first reaction was something like, well, isn't that, hasn't that been debunked? We asked Duncan to go with us to Israel where a lab called Energetics Technologies has reported some of the biggest energy gains yet. We are delivering um, power into the cell. When I got there, I just kept asking about, okay, how do you know this? How do you know that? How do you get 30%? I mean, Duncan spent two days examining cold fusion experiments. I mean, I'm just skeptical because I'm always skeptical. And investigating whether the measurements were accurate. Do you measure that aluminum temperature directly or just assume it's equal? And when you walked out of the Israeli lab, you thought what? I thought, wow, they've done something very interesting here. He crunched the numbers himself and searched for an explanation other than a nuclear effect. I found that the work done was carefully done and that the excess heat, as I see it now, is quite real. Are you surprised to hear yourself saying this? Very much. I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> and we found that the Pentagon is saying it too. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, known as DARPA, did its own analysis, and we obtained this internal memo that concludes there is, quote, no doubt that anomalous excess heat is produced in these experiments. Do you feel vindicated after all these years? I don't have any real need for vindication. I know what I've seen. That was a pretty big smile on your face, though. <laughs> It's, it's good. It's not bad. Certainly it's good. Now the Pentagon is funding more experiments at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C., and at McCubrey's lab in California. We wondered what Richard Garwin would think of the Defense Department's appraisal. The experiments leave no doubt that anomalous excess heat is produced. Well, that's a statement. You just don't buy that. Well, I am living proof that there's doubt. Now, they can say that, that an 
excess heat is being produced, but they can't say there's no doubt. All they can say is they don't doubt, but I doubt. If you ask me, is this going to have any impact on our energy policy, it's impossible to say because we don't fundamentally understand the process yet. But to say that we don't fundamentally understand the process, and that's why we're not going to study it, is like saying I'm too sick to go to the doctor. You know, I wonder how you feel about going public endorsing this phenomenon on 60 Minutes, when maybe 90 percent, I'm guessing, uh -huh. of your colleagues think that it's crackpot science. I certainly was among those 90 percent before I looked at the data and I can see where they'll be very concerned when they see this piece. All I have to say is read the published re results, talk to the scientists, never let anybody else do your thinking for you. There was one more scientist we wanted to find, a man who left America in disgrace and retired with his wife to the English countryside. Martin Fleischmann, the man who announced cold fusion to the world, is hindered now by years diabetes, Parkinson's disease, and maybe a little bitterness. At home, he pulled out an improved version of his experiment, something that he was working on when he was hounded out of science. When you hold that in your hand and you think back on what's happened these last 20 years, what do you think? The wasted opportunity. Wasted? Mm. Because it was discredited at the time. Mm. He told us he has two regrets calling the nuclear effect fusion, a name coined by a competitor, if you loaded the cell with heavy water, and having that news conference, something he says the University of Utah wanted. Now that you know that your experiments have been replicated and, and improved upon in labs all around the world, I wonder, do you see a day when homes will be powered by these cells, when cars will be powered by these cells? Hmm. I think so. It, it won't take very long to implement this. <laughs> you make me feel that I should take a part in this. <laughs> I'm getting you interested again? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> the potential is exciting. The potential is exciting, yes.